Hello everyone, my name is Matthias Vanunas and today I'm going to tell you about how mathematics can be used to study uh, objects in high dimensions and what can we say about symmetries of things and uh, I will talk a bit about application to viruses as well. Um, so on this lecture I'm going to tell you all uh, a bit about symmetries on a plane, so uh, what kind of symmetric objects we can have um, and how we can describe them mathematically. Um, in the, the next the second part of the talk, I will say something about how we can study similar things but in higher dimensions. So even in dimensions four and five and six, uh, we can have uh, symmetric objects which we can describe um, and, uh, and we can study them. And uh, in the end, I'm going to tell you about uh, how we can use everything, uh, everything that I said to, to build nested structures, uh, which look nice, and how we can study viruses um, with, this, uh, with these things as well. Um, okay, so let's start with um, symmetries. Um, so, so, so we start with symmetries on a plane, um, which is a, just a two-dimensional object, so just a flat thing. Um, and uh, a symmetry basically is just a transformation that does not change distances, that does not change angles or sizes. So just if you have a flat object, you can move it around, um, but you cannot uh, like stretch it or do something like that. Um, Okay, so what kind of symmetries we can have? So there are three main types of symmetries. Uh, so uh, translation is the first of them. And uh, this is just to move things around without changing the orientation, without changing the, um, uh, the, way, the way thing is presented. So if you have something uh, that that you can has top and bottom, then you can see that the top and bottom doesn't change. We just move it. Um, on the other hand, we can have rotation in which we could put a put a finger on on the plane. So say we have we have a drawing on a on a table, uh, a drawing of placed on the table. So we can just put a finger uh, in this drawing and then rotate. Around this, uh, around the finger to get transformation, which looks something like this. Um, and uh, the third type, probably that that I wanted to tell you about, is reflection. So that is uh, just um, uh, flipping the object. So we can think about uh, having a transparent film uh, and with something written on this film, so we can flip it over. Uh, to have uh, to have it facing the other way, um, and that that would be um, transformation presented here as reflection. So these are three main types. Uh, but uh, what we want to study indeed in mathematics is we want to study objects which are uh, which do not change uh, when when we do these kind of things. So uh, so our main uh, first question now is what kind of objects um, do we do not change when we apply certain symmetries to them? Uh, so I will talk a bit about finite objects and a bit about infinite objects. Um, so uh, so let's start with symmetries of the second two types, so which, which are rotations and reflections, um, and this can be. Is there are finite objects uh, which do not change when we apply rotations and reflections. Um, so what, uh, what's an example of such thing? Um, so we have uh, symmetric shapes, um, which, which are in very symmetric finite shapes, which, which are invariant under reflections and rotations. The, the simplest example of such thing is a regular polygon. Um, so we can have like a triangle or a square or something like that. Um, and so uh, and and uh, what kind of 
so there, we cannot have any rotation or any reflection um, of these things, but we can have some of them. So for instance, if you have a pentagon, so that's just a polygon with five uh, vertices, um, we can uh, rotate it one fifth of, of the way around. Uh, so that's uh, what we can see in the blue arrow. And we can also say, uh, flip it over uh, like this on the, on the, on the plane. Um, square is also a similar um, situation. So we have, we can rotate it now one fourth of a turn, so by 90 degrees, um, or we can just flip it over and either, either it's reflection in a diagonal where we, uh, we just keep the diagonal in place and flip it over like this, or, um, or we have, um, uh, just like more usual probably more regular flipping over so just flipping it over in this uh, axis um, and uh, so that's what we study in mathematics that's uh, what I study in my work um, and uh, in particular I study objects which are called groups so this is just a mathematical description of, of uh, how we can describe the symmetries of things. Um, and uh, now that's about finite objects, but what about infinite objects? Um, so we have, we can have objects called lattices um, and it is a periodic arrangement. So arrangement that, uh, that does not change when you shift it uh, in one or the other direction. So when you have a translation. Um, and uh, so this can be described just as points where uh, lines on a, some grid cross each other. So here are some examples. Um, so the usual, the most usual grid probably you can think of, uh, the most common grid you can think of is um, just a square grid. Um, here on the top left. Um, we can stretch it a bit and deform it to have another grid, which doesn't look that, that regular maybe, that nice. Um, or we can have a grid uh, consisting of uh, triangles, like at the bottom. Um, so in, in and uh, when we study lattices, we want to study the points of intersections of lines in this grid. So these blue dots um, are, are what, what is called a lattice or these black dots. Um, and uh, yeah, we can re just remove the line to see what kind of arrangements we can have. Um, so these type of arrangements, they are invariant. They do not change a, when we do translation. So for instance, we can take a, uh, this square lattice and just move this point over here to this point over here. Um, but uh, they, they can also be, uh, have some other symmetries. Um, so, uh, and what we are trying to do, we're trying to combine the symmetries you saw before with the polygons, with the symmetries you see here with the lattices, which are just translating. Um, so what can we have? Uh, so our question now is, given a polygon, is there some two-dimensional lattice, this, this grid of points, with the same symmetry? So we don't care that much about which, what kind of object we study, but we care about what symmetry it has. Um, so for a square, uh, the answer is yes. As we saw before, we have the grid like this which is a square grid, and it has the same symmetries as a square, so we can also flip it over and it doesn't change. Um, we can rotate it by 90 degrees and it doesn't change. So a square, for a square, we can combine these symmetries. For a triangle, um, again, we saw the other grid, um, and we can rotate it now by 120 degrees, one third of the turn, um, or we can flip it over and again, it doesn't change. Uh, so we have, uh, triangles are 
nice in this in this uh, respect. But what about things like a pentagon? So at first you may think, well, maybe we can find some arrangement of points on a plane uh, that a pentagon will have symmetries and uh, it it doesn't it doesn't change the 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 pentagons the symmetries of the pentagon doesn't change the, your object. But uh, in the end, it turns out that we can't have anything like that. Um, so to have some sort of nice arrangements with symmetries of a pentagon, we need to do some other constructions. And that's what we're trying to, to see, what we're trying to achieve. Uh, so now let's look at what's the situation in the higher dimensions. Um, so in three dimensions, um, so what you think about as a space where you live, where you can not only move left, right, or up, down, but also we can go forward and backward. Um, in this uh, three-dimensional space, uh, you have polyhedra, and pol a polyhedron is basically just a three-dimensional version of a polygon. Uh, so now um, you have something like a cube. Um, that's a similar, that's a simple example of a polyhedron. And uh, you can see again, cube has some certain symmetries. So for instance, you can take a midpoints of two faces and just rotate it one quarter of a turn. Uh, and if you, if you have a cube next to you, like a Rubik's cube or something like that, you can see that, that this doesn't change apart from the colors maybe. Um, or you can rotate it one third of a turn when you pick two opposite points on the cube, two opposite vertices, and just rotate it one third of, 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 of the turn. Um, or you can also, in three dimensions, uh, you can reflect. So you can flip it over. Well, in this case, it's, it's not that easy because um, there's no there's no not much that much space to move so so that you can imagine reflection of flipping it over but you can just uh, imagine the left and the right faces of the cube just changing places so just doing something like moving uh, one to the other um and uh, another example of a polyhedron uh, um that i wanted to tell you about is an icosahedron uh, so this is a bit more complicated. Uh, it has 20 triangles, 20 triangular faces um, arranged in this way. And again, it has various symmetries. So for instance, you can pick two of these triangular faces and just rotate around them um, by 120 degrees. Uh, so that's a third of, of the full turn. And uh, again, you, you get what you started with. Um, or you can pick just two, two vertices, two opposite points in your polyhedron and rotate it one fifth of a turn um, by 72 degrees uh, as written here, and uh, you have the same thing. Um, so again, the same as in two dimensions, the same question arises. Uh, we have something that's invariant under rotations and reflections. But what about translations? Can we have some, some, uh, something in three dimensions that you sh move it, you shift it to some, uh, somewhere, and it uh, stays the same? And uh, the answer now is yes, that we can have a three-dimensional lattice, which is the same as two-dimensional lattice, basically. It is some periodic arrangement of points, so we can have, you can draw a grid in three dimensions. Maybe it's a bit harder to imagine, but you can draw a grid something like this. Um, just imagine continuing to infinity. Um, and then uh, in this case, um, you can move things in three, three directions so that doesn't change. So if you move something on one unit left, uh, so one unit right, it doesn't change. Or you move it one unit up, doesn't change and you can also move forwards and backwards. Um, so, uh, and here you can see again that this big infinite object is associated to a small thing, which is a cube. Uh, so, so this 
in addition to, to moving to, sh to translating your lattice, you can also have all symmetries of a cube um, in here. Uh, so, so cube is good in this respect, that we don't need to do anything else. We already have, um, we already can, can see cube as, as in some big infinite object, uh, which, which has the properties that we are trying to see. Um, but what about something like icosahedron that you saw before? It's another polyhedron. Uh, so could we have some three-dimensional arrangement such that we shift it um, and doesn't change? And in addition, it has a sim the symmetry of, of uh, the icosahedron. So here, um, it turns out that it's not that easy. So, so in particular, we have a pentagon here on, on the icosahedron. And this is basically what ruined things in two dimensions. So in two dimensions, we saw that we couldn't have any lattice with symmetries of a pentagon. In three dimensions, it turns out that it's exactly the same situation, that pentagon somehow uh, restricting us so we cannot have um, anything bad. So in particular, the, the rotation of one fifth of the turn uh, around two, two opposite vertices of icosahedron, um, this rotation is what ruins things, and we cannot have um, we cannot have a three-dimensional lattice with the same symmetries of icosahedron. Okay, so so now the question is: Okay, uh, we 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 look at something like a pentagon, and we saw that in two dimensions. Um, in two dimensions, you cannot have any infinite arrangement that is symmetric on the uh, translations and the symmetries of a pentagon. In three dimensions, it's the same thing, uh, that we cannot have anything like that. Uh, so what if we just keep adding dimensions? Then what happens? So first of all, we need to define things. Uh, so it's not that easy to, to see things now that we cannot draw them, but we, in mathematics, using mathematics, we can uh, describe things and describe the same things that we saw in the pictures in the two and three dimensions. We can describe it in any dimension we want. So uh, we can describe in particular what it means for a lattice to exist. Uh, so again, we, we don't have any picture, but we can, we can see um, we can use mathematics to, to describe how it looks. And uh, you can describe also something called polytopes, which are a generalization of polygons and polyhedra. Um, and these again exist in any dimension. Um, so, um, and what our aim is, what, well, our aim is um, to find finite objects uh, that uh, and then uh, that have the, have the same symmetry as some lattice. So, um, in particular, these symmetries of if uh, if you have a finite object, some polytope in this case, and it has a sim symmetry of a lattice, uh, then we call symmetries of this polytope crystallographic. Um, and the name comes from things. Uh, the, the name comes from the word crystal. Uh, so, if you take something. Uh, like one of these rings, one of these three things. And so here you can see the diamond, a pyrite, and a quartz. Um, these three crystals, when you look it, at these things under microscope, what you actually see is a lattice, a three-dimensional lattice that um, I described above. Um, so here, even in, in the middle picture, you can see that this this minerals have like nice uh, structure, they look like cubes. Mm, so it's because when you look at it close together at how the atoms are arranged, in, in, then you can see that uh, they are arranged very regularly, like points in a lattice. Um, so this is where, where name crystallographic comes from. And now we want to see which symmetries, if we add more dimensions, well, what can we have? Um, so for a pentagon, we saw that uh, there's no 
there's no symmetries, there's no translations um, such that uh, there's, no, there's no lattice uh, that has, uh, that is invariant under some translations and also invariant under symmetries of the pentagon. So we saw there's, there's no such thing in two dimensions and there's no such thing in three dimensions. But in four dimensions, turns out that if you add a, a fourth, um, a fourth dimension, a fourth axis to your coordinates, um, then you can have symmetries of the pentagon realized there um, in in some some sort of object. Um, or in for in case of icosahedron, which because icosahedron, uh, as you saw, has not only symmetries of the pentagon, it also has uh, one third of a turn symmetries of a triangle. It has more things. Uh, so four dimensions aren't not enough, but six dimensions, it turns out that six is the number uh, that we need to go. Um, so we can have symmetric object in six dimensions, which has the same symmetries as an icosahedron. Okay, so we can describe these things. Um, we can describe it all we want, but uh, the question is, uh, how do we see these uh, things? So imagine we have some four dimensional object with symmetries of the pentagon. Um, how do we see that it actually has symmetries of the pentagon if we cannot draw this? Um, and the answer to that uh, is uh, we use something called a projection. So we can think about them as shadows on, or from a higher dimension. So the same way um, you can think about shadows uh, as an example, to make three-dimensional object into something two-dimensional. Um, so when the sun shines and you see uh, your shadow, it is two-dimensional. Um, so we have something like this, um, for instance. So here's an icosahedron again, and it has, um, so it has 12 vertices in total. So we can think about this, this, these uh, vertices in here. In the outer, uh, in the, the the outer part of the drawing, we have six vertices which form a hexagon, and in the inner part of the drawing, you have uh, three vertices that you can see, and three behind behind here you cannot see, but there are three vertices uh, as well. So when you take a shadow of this thing, what happens is you just see a two-dimensional thing. Um, what we call a projection, um, and it's just a two-dimensional um, hexagon uh, in the outer part and uh, then another hexagon in the inner part. Um, so, and this basically tells us that if we take uh, our higher dimensional thing and project it down, we have some nested structure. So these, these are two hexagons, but the one is sitting inside each other. So it's like um, uh, we can have like um, some sort of onion structure where, where layers are nested. Um, and uh, so from two, when going from two dimensions to one dimensions, I can show you um, maybe more precisely uh, what we are doing. So we take a symmetric arrangement uh, like uh, this lattice in two dimensions. So we have lattices in two dimensions. Um, and we can take some symmetric arrangement in, in, in here. So for instance, here I took an octagon, um, which has the same symmetries as a square, if you imagine a, squ a smaller square sitting here. Um, and uh, so it, 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 has, it has some symmetries. And now suppose we have some line, so that's a one-dimensional thing. Um, so we have a, a line going uh, here in the middle, um, and uh, we want to show what happens when we go from two dimensions to one dimension. So what the projection does, uh, what the projection does is basically takes every blue point um, and moves it to uh, a point, a red point here that is closest to it. Uh, in in on this line, and we have some sort of uh, one-dimensional arrangement. Now we can see on the line we have just eight points 
uh, but there is some symmetry still still preserved here. So for instance, um, we can take uh, this point over here and flip the line over around this point. Um, and uh, then this, this will not change, the arrangement will not change. Uh, so we, we somehow we had symmetries of a square, now we have less symmetries, but we have fewer dimensions. And we, when we take really high dimensions, um, like four and five and six, um, this allows us to maybe not to see the whole picture, uh, but to see some shadow in two or three dimensions that we can then draw, and uh, we can we can see how it looks like. Um, so uh, here's what we get in case of uh, pentagons. So we take some symmetric arrangement and four-dimensional lattice. Um, it contains a bunch of points. Um, and uh, then we project it down to some two, di to two dimensions. And when we do this, we can see that um, we can see some sort of nested structure. So different layers here of the structure are, are, are represented in different colors. So we have some, some points uh, on the outside, some points on the inside, some points in the middle. Um, and it, it has symmetries of a pentagon. So you can, you, could, you can see that, for instance, if you take this arrangement and rotate it by 72 degrees, one fifth of the turn, um, then uh, it will come back to where it was. Uh, so that's how you can get something with symmetries of a pentagon. Um, what about higher dimensions? So here we can use the same techniques uh, to, to see uh, something that has symmetries of an icosahedron. So these, these two um, polyhedra that you can see here, uh, again, sort of nested structure. You have, an, a, you have one in the outside and one in the inside. Um, and this way we can see um, that, um, th that uh, from, from projecting from six dimensions to three dimensions, we can have some sort of nested uh, structures like this, and uh, it, they have icosahedral like, symmetry. So, uh, yeah, you can see you can see it has like you can uh, it has some pentagons, pentagonal things inside here. So you can rotate one fifth of the turn and doesn't change. Or uh, you have some sort of triangular th things as well. So, for instance, this this hexagon has symmetries of a of a triangle, um, and you can again rotate one third of the turn there. Um, okay, so uh, this is the example, the, the, the one of the things that we want to study. Um, so the symmetries of an icosahedron and how we can see it, um, how we can use higher dimensions to somehow produce these objects. Um, so many objects have the same symmetries of an, an, as an icosahedron. So we can see the polyhedra here. Um, so I just uh, picked three pictures of the polyhedra. So this is called dodecahedron, icosadodecahedron, and uh, I believe rhombicosadodecahedron. They have complicated names. Um, but you can see that although these look like different pictures, they have all have the same symmetry as an icosahedron. Uh, but uh, these are just mathematical objects, um, but there are actually some real life objects that you can see uh, in your life that have the same symmetries. Uh, so for instance, probably most of you have seen a football. So, so a football, uh, if, if you look at how it, in this, it is arranged, how the, the, the black and the, the white faces are arranged, it also has symmetries of an icosahedron. Um, there are some buildings, some nice buildings. Uh, so this one, I believe, is uh, some science museum in Vancouver, uh, which also has the same symmetries of an icosahedron. But what I wanted to study um, here are mostly viruses. Many viruses have this property that they have the same symmetries. Um, so, uh, so here you can see 
again, uh, some pointy things. Uh, so it's not exactly an icosahedron, but it has the same symmetry. Um, okay, so how we can study these things? Uh, so uh, we do um, what I said before, we, we use nested polyhedra. Um, so the, the one, the, the, the example you saw before, uh, it looks like the picture on the right. And on the other hand, on the left, we have some biological object, which is a virus. Um, and it, 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 is, it is a bit more complicated. Um, so, uh, so what do we see in, this, in these pictures? Uh, well, we want to match somehow uh, this picture on the left, which is, which is what exactly we have in the real life and biology, with picture on the right uh, to somehow describe what we see, what we see through the microscope, describe it mathematically. So first we just remove the edges, we keep the, the points, just the vertices of, of our polyhedron, um, and uh, we have some sort of nested structure. So perhaps when we cut it, if we cut things open, we can see better what structures we have. Um, so in biology, again, we have a virus and the virus has some thickness um, in here um, between the outside and the inside. Uh, and the nested polyhedra, again, we have some sort of two layers. Um, so what happens, um, what, what we do is we try to combine these pictures in a way that uh, we somehow, the outer layer in mathematics describes the outer layer in biology and the inner layer describes the inner layer. Um, so when we combine these things, we get a picture like this. Um, so here points, um, the, these blue and these green points, they just come from, from our mathematics, from, from projection from six dimensions um, down to, to three dimensions to have something that we can draw. Um, and uh, in, in, the, in the middle between these green and blue points, you can see the virus. Um, how it looks like. So it is a way to produce nice pictures, but it's also a way to study something and maybe we can tell more uh, in biology as well. Um, so for these, the pictures part, um, I would invite you to see more. Um, so uh, this, this, um, there are more pictures like this in the Wanshin Gallery at the Mathematical Institute at the University of Wroclaw. Um, and uh, so they, they, you can see more things, um, more nice, nice looking pictures, which also have some, some basis in real life in biology. Uh, so this is open for the first half of October. And yeah, and that's everything I wanted to say. So thank you for your attention.